Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today's reading will be taken from Acts chapter 10, from verses 1 to 35, and verses 44 to 46. This can be found in pages 1,103 in your Red Church Bibles. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God he came, who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon Atana, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on a journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven and something like a sheet, large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have, not, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that the Lord has made clean. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped by the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house of his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting him and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to be associated or with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent, when, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to, the, to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. 
Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation for one who fears him and does what is right. And from verse 44, um, next page. Um, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard him from speaking in tongues and praising God. This is a word of the Lord. Well done, that was a good chunky reading. Um, well, good morning. Um, in the building, good morning online. My name is Yana. I'm one of the pastors on the team here. Um, I'm on mat leave right now, just back for the day. They call it a keeping in touch day. Um, normally, I'm at the 345 um, with our kids, and I really only get to come to the morning services on special occasions. So it's very nice to be here. Um, this morning, we are going through our sermon series in the book of Acts, the record of the very earliest months and years of the church. Um, and this morning, we're looking at this account of the day when not just a Roman, no, 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 a Roman centurion comes to follow Jesus and is filled with the Holy Spirit, him and all his household. And we have not only that, we have the backstory to that happening too, which includes this vision that Peter has with the sheet and the reptiles and it comes down three times and all the rest of it. Um, having done my homework and the reading and the studying for this, I have come to think of this as Peter's finest hour. It doesn't necessarily look at it, look like that when you first, when it first pass, but I think it is. It is certainly one of the most important moments in, in his entire leadership. So what we're gonna do actually is that the first half of our time together is we're gonna get excavating. We're gonna go through this passage a little bit and just try to uncover what's actually happening here. And then the second half of our time, we're gonna pull a few things out that are relevant for us. Um, today, we're gonna talk about how God goes ahead of his people and how God sends all his people. But let me pray for us as we dive in. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much that you don't leave us to decipher your word on our own or in a vacuum that you promised to help us. And so we ask for your help this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you fill each of us? We pray you give us clear minds and clear hearts to hear everything that you would want to say to us. Amen. <clears throat> okay, let's get excavating. I think we struggle to catch just how momentous this event is. So what we're going to do is we're going to whiz through this and pull out a few things that give us a flavor of what a big deal this event is, how momentous. So let me show you. First, we start with Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion on remarkably good terms with the Jews around him, but he's a God-fearing man. And he sees an angel. Well, told in verse 3, if you have it in front of you, he distinctly saw an angel. This is not normal. I know we're used to angels popping up in the Bible all the time, but they're really rare. And, in, and actually, an angel coming to a Gentile that is a non-Jew is virtually unheard of. Again, I've been doing my homework. I cannot find another example of an angel coming to a Gentile like this with a message where they have a conversation in all of scripture before this point. This is virtually unheard of. God is doing something wild. He is sending his special messengers to outsiders, to people outside of the Jewish family. We are supposed to hear a change in the wind. If we look forward a bit um, down, we know that Cornelius follows the angel's instructions. He sends some guys down to Joppa to fetch Peter. And then we have Peter's vision. And there's no two ways about it. This is wacky stuff. <laughs> he sees this sheet and it's three times and all the rest of it. I'm not going to spend too much on this. Essentially, God is telling Peter here, there's a change in the wind. Something momentous is coming. Basically, the vision means that the customs that God had given the Jewish people, like the kosher food laws, they used to be a sign to show you were included in God's people. And God says, Peter, as of today, basically, they are no longer a sign of that. 
Not that the kosher food laws were pointless or even that they weren't to be followed anymore by the Jews. There's simply no longer a way to distinguish who is part of God's people. Now they're just a way to know if you're a Jew, not a way to know if you are part of God's people or not. That's what the vision is getting at. If you want to do a deep dive into this stuff, and trust me, there are deep places to dive here, I can recommend something called the Bible Project. We've got a little slide. Um, This is just outstanding biblical scholarship in a really kind of accessible and not at all scary way. And uh, they have a podcast. They've done a whole episode on this event. It's part of a kind of longer series. But the one you're looking for is called Who's In from January 2021. You can Google it. There's great stuff there. The next momentous thing to see Cornelius goes um, with the, um, the guys from Cornelius, and if you look down at verse 27, while talking to him, we're told, Peter went inside. Now, Jews didn't go into the home of Gentiles. That's one of the customs that God had given them. We don't even have a record of Jesus doing this. There's a very good chance that Peter has, has only done this a few times in his life, but um, probably he never has. But he has begun to grasp what God was getting at in the vision, and he enters the house. I think Peter gets full marks for this. Inside, he finds it is full of people. Cornelius has gathered all of his friends and family. They're all there, hungry for God, waiting. And Peter says, effectively... <laughs> It's a really big thing for me to be here. And then we have verse 33, which I think I have a new theory that Cornelius was in fact British because of verse 33. If you notice what he says, acknowledging Peter's um, coming there, he says, it was good of you to come. Isn't that the most British heartwarming thing you ever heard? It was good of you to come. Now, I don't know what's going through Peter's head here. But he sees this room full of people hungry for God. And maybe he remembers that Jesus said something about having sheep in a different sheep pen. And maybe he remembers the last thing he heard from Jesus three times. Feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my lambs. And maybe he thought, oh, here they are. Whatever he thought, he starts to share the good news of Jesus. And this is all really exciting. There's an amazing sermon there that we're just gonna skip over because we don't have time. And lastly, we have the most momentous thing, which comes in verse 44. Have a look. We're told, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. As these Gentiles hear about Jesus and begin to put their faith in him, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Scholars consider this uh, the second Pentecost. This is the Pentecost for the Gentiles. Or as I have come to think of it, I think of it this is Pentecost, the expansion pack. We're told Peter is still speaking. Now that sounds like a quirky little detail, but it's really important. It means there was no time for lots of things to happen, including these Gentiles have not had time to convert to Judaism yet. Remember, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He was born Jewish, he lived Jewish, he died Jewish, resurrected and forever Jewish. He kept Jewish customs, mostly. He taught and healed Jewish people almost exclusively. The assumption, and the fair assumption, I think, was that if you wanted to follow the Jewish Messiah, you would convert to Judaism. But there's no time for that. Before the Holy Spirit comes on them as they are outsiders in their not remotely Jewish state and confirms them as fully part of the people of God. And this absolutely blows the Jewish believer's mind. We're told in verse 45, they are astonished that the Holy Spirit has come on the Gentiles. This is a huge shift. God dramatically expands who can be included in his family. 
If we step right back and we look at this through the lens of all of Scripture up until this point, we see that God's heart was always that people of any culture, language, ethnic group, regardless of race, gender, class, could be included equally in his people. And God's long-term plan was to pick one family to partner with him in his mission to every family. He picked a normal family because he loves normal people, hallelujah, and he picked Abraham and his family, which became the Jewish people. The plan was that as he partnered with the Jewish people, they would become two things. Number one, a window into what he was like. As, he, as they worked with him and, and lived with him and worshiped him, he, the world would be able to see what God was like. They would see the steady love of God. They'd see the patience of God. They'd see the power of God to provide. They would be a window into what God was like. And secondly, that they would be a funnel, that through them, the blessing of God would flow to every other family. There were to be a window and a funnel. They failed on both counts. Despite God's relentless patience, And how many times he picked them up and told them he loved them and told them to plan again, they proved themselves to be the bottleneck. And so Jesus comes, a Jew, the Jew, if you like, to complete the task that the Jews were given. He becomes the true Israelite, the perfect window to display what God is like. One better than a window, God himself standing there in front of the world wanting to be known. And he becomes the perfect funnel through whom the blessing of God, the forgiveness of God, the presence of God could be uh, poured out on anyone, everyone. Jesus fulfills the task of the Jewish people. Their role is fulfilled in him. And now here, as these outsiders turn to Jesus, the family of God expands as it had always been planned to. The Holy Spirit comes on this group of outsiders and includes them in the family of God. And the Holy Spirit heralds the beginning of a new age. Now is the time when the fullness of God is available to anyone. This is one of the most exciting days in all of human history. And this, by the way, is the age we live in now. Now is the time when the fullness of God is available to anyone who would humble themselves and ask. Now, that is what's happening here. That's that's a, a flavor of how momentous this is. Now, what principles, what truths might we pull out of this um, for us today? Two, two points for us, two things about what God is like. The first is this, God goes ahead of his people. God goes ahead of his people. This is all over this passage. This expansion is not something that Peter and the other church leaders kind of dreamed up as part of a like 10-year growth plan or something like this. God initiates all over this. God is the engine behind this expansion. He sends the angel to Cornelius. He gives the vision to Peter. He puts his Holy Spirit directly on the Gentiles before the Jews know what's going on. God just goes right ahead. He prepares those he wants. He calls those he wants. He falls on who he wants to fall on. And God still does this. He's still the engine behind the expansion of his kingdom. He does not wait for our approval. He is the Lord. And he doesn't wait for his people to sort out their cultural hang-ups or get all their ducks in a row. He is well ahead of us, working in anyone who is hungry for him. Not just the people who look like God's type, anyone who is hungry for God. A couple examples of this. There was a revival in Chile in the 70s. And uh, there was a couple called David and Mary Pitches who um, were really significant in this country. They started new wine and other things, if that means anything to you. Uh, But before they were here doing that, um, they were in Chile. And David was a bishop helping to look after some Chilean uh, churches and vicars. And one day, one of his Chilean vicars came to him and said, Bishop, (laughs) I need a holiday. I wonder if you could arrange some cover or something for me. And David said, yes, of course, absolutely. What's going on? And he said, well, 
I just keep getting woken up in the middle of the night. People know where I live, and they come knocking on my door asking to be converted. <laughs> and I've not had a decent night's sleep for ages. <laughs> what a reason to need a holiday. Or another example, um, Bilki Sheikh was a Pakistani woman with almost no, um, no contact with Christianity whatsoever, and some strange things began to happen. Um, one of the things was she had a very vivid dream. And in her dream, um, Jesus came and had dinner with her. She knew somehow that it was Jesus. And then uh, the dream shifted, Jesus left, and she was on a mountain with this other man who again somehow she knew the name of. He had this weird name called John the Baptist. And so she started pleading with this man. She says, do you know where Jesus is? He was here. I have to find him. John the Baptist, can you lead me to Jesus? And she woke herself up shouting, John the Baptist, John the Baptist. She does not know there is such a person. She doesn't even know really where to start looking. But she knows where the crazy local Christian missionaries live. <laughs> so she gets herself into her car and she drives around and she knocks on the door and she basically asks, is there such a person as John the Baptist and is he connected with Jesus? Doesn't that sound like straight out of the book of Acts? God still does this. This is even the story of some of our brothers and sisters here at HT who met Jesus in dreams when they weren't even looking for him. God goes ahead of his people. It's exciting to think that God is well ahead of us. He sends people to us, not just us to people. It's the difference between thinking, you know, oh, we got to get this train moving. We got to tell people about Jesus. We got to build the track. We got to plot a route, you know, and realizing the train is just, it is just going. And the engine at the heart of this is the relentless love of God who is always looking for the one who is far off. The goodness of God that's always looking for the next heart to pour his goodness out onto. The train is moving and we have to hustle to keep up. I think this gives us another way to pray. It adds a category to the things that we can ask God for. You know, we can't give people dreams. We can't send angels to military leaders of occupying forces, but we can ask God. We know he loves to work this way, and he still does. We can pray for it. That's an exciting prayer. This gives us another way to plan. We are now have to keep our eyes out and look for what God is already doing. We have to dream things up. We can look and see where is the hand of God at work. It gives us another way to be useful. And this won't be true of all of us, but you know, for some of us, sometimes we feel a bit stuck because most of our circle are already Christians. Maybe our families are Christians, our good friends are Christians, and you know, everybody else, you know, is part of our course, or we know it from wherever. We've already badgered about the Alpha course forever, and you know, it's only fair to give them a break and we'll pray for them. But you know, we feel stuck. What are we supposed to do now? But if this is the way that God works, why not start praying, God, here I am. I'm available. I give you permission to send people knocking on my door, even in the middle of the night. Give me eyes to see what you might be doing. You are ahead of me. Show me where you want me to be useful. God goes ahead of his people. Um, just to say also, David and Mary have lots of really cool stories. They did a Zoom interview back in COVID. We have a little slide for this. It might have come up before and I didn't notice, but um, it's on YouTube now. So if you just search David and Mary Pitches, there's a spelling of their name, and Revival Conversations. It's got a bit of a preamble, but it's a long interview and it's so inspiring. I really um, encourage you to have a look. Um, and Bill Keese's autobiography, which is quite a classic now, but it's amazing. It's called I Dare to Call Him Father. That dream was just the beginning of quite an amazing walk with the Lord. God goes ahead of his people. And our second point, God sends all of his people. God sends all his people. After all this about God going ahead of us, let's not miss the fact that Peter has to go. <laughs> if you'll forgive me for making a fairly obvious point here. He has to go, and it's not easy for him. He is light years away from his comfort zone. This is another planet for him. But he has a role to play. He's there to explain the truth and the hope of Jesus and to witness what God is doing. God sends him. 
but not just Peter. Have a look at verse 46 with me. This is so cool. We're told that the Gentiles were were speaking in tongues when the Holy Spirit came on them. Now, this is not just a sign, this, this gift of tongues business, not just a sign that this is one of those prayer meetings that got a little bit, you know, whoop. Um, and when it comes to Pentecost, the gift of tongues was tied to being witnesses for Jesus in the languages of the world. It was a sign of purpose, of authority, of mission, of partnership with God. And here, it's poured out on the Gentiles. They too are called to partner with God. They too are full members of the team. Not only does God include the outsiders, he gives them the same job, the same mission as anyone else. There's not like some sort of class system, you know, everyone's in, but these are the ones I send and these are the ones I don't. God sends all his people here. And he still does. Another little story from David and Mary Pitches. Mary tells a story about going to a revival meeting, prayer meeting in Chile. And this was a Pentecostal one, so it really was one of those ones that was a bit whoop. Um, but and she brought with her somebody who happened to be staying with them at a time who was a very proper kind of laced up Scotsman, Presbyterian or something, so not Pentecostal. But he was staying with them, so along he comes and he kind of stands in the corner. Anyway, there's all this stuff happening. Mary spots one of the girls from one of their Chilean churches on the side, just crying her eyes out. So Marie goes over to her and says, you know, what's wrong? Can I pray for you or something? And the girl's just heartbroken. She's just like, God is meeting with everyone except me. I feel so left out. And Mary says her heart broke for this girl and she got so angry that it just like bubbled up in her. And she said, in the name of Jesus, come Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fills this girl. So she's so full of joy. She starts leaping and dancing around. But she's also given the gift of tongues. And this little Chilean girl from the back of beyond who cannot speak a word of English is given the gift of tongues in English. And she starts praising Jesus in fluent English in front of this Scotsman, leaping around. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you, Jesus. Is it a funny thought to think of people being given the gift of tongues to reach the English? Friends, it happens because the heart of God longs to reach the English as much as he longs to reach the Chilean. From every nation, he calls his people, and to every nation, he calls his people. Peter has to go. The Gentiles are empowered to go. And we too are sent. Sometimes it's to people who are like us, and sometimes it's to people who are really, really not like us. But God sends all his people. Now I think if you've spent much time in church, you know this. You might even have preached this, God sends all of us, he sends you, he sends me, and it's amazing. But for lots of us in our secret heart of hearts. Deep down, we consider ourselves, just us, an exception to this. We consider ourselves the outsider, the one that God can't or won't use. Maybe because our personality doesn't feel quite right, or our education, or our family background, or our church background or because of some past failure we can't fix. Let me tell you something. God is on the move, and he wants you on the train. And the enemy wants you on the bench so bad. He knows that if you, you partner with God, if you are filled with the power and love of God, with the heart of God, there's very little that he can do. So he will lie to you. He'll tell you that you're too quiet, that you're too dumb, that you're too awkward, you're too proper and straight-laced, maybe even that you're too British. He would tell you that your past failures disqualify you. It is a lie. 
It is what my little American grandmother would call baloney. He just wants to keep you on the bench. God sends all his people. He sends us in different ways to different people to different degrees, but he wants to partner with all his kids. He wants to pour his love and his power on all of us to craft us and lead us and transform us like he does with Peter here. The qualification doesn't come from us, it comes from him. Let us not disqualify ourselves when God does not. If we make ourselves available, he will empower us. God sends all his people. And we're gonna finish there and we're gonna move into a time of responding, but we've been looking at the second Pentecost, Pentecost, the expansion pack. And usually when we respond after a time, uh, response after a talk, we kind of say, you know, why don't you come forward for this reason or you can come forward for that reason. And that's a good way of doing it. But today, I do not care what the reason is. If for any reason you, you need something from God today, ask him. If for any reason you need the help of God, ask him. If for any reason you feel an outsider or far from God, ask him to come find you. Now is the time when the fullness of God is available for anyone. Ask him. And friends, we are British and he loves us, so we're not gonna do anything weird and wacky, okay? I'm gonna invite the band up if you guys wanna jump up. And we're gonna worship, but I invite you to use this time to pray and ask God to come and meet you and fill you with his Holy Spirit for any reason. Or maybe there's someone that you want God to run ahead of you and, and meet with, pray for that. We're gonna use this time to worship, to pray, to invite God to come and meet with us, just kind of where we are. Um, so if I can invite you to stand, I'll just pray for us as we start and we'll move into to prayer and worship. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you that you are always running towards us, wanting to pour your love and power, your healing, your forgiveness out over us. Thank you that you've been running towards us for a long time. And we pray you would come and meet with us again this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come, Spirit of the living God. Would you come and meet with us today? Come and meet us where we need help, where we need power. Come, Holy Spirit, as we worship and pray.